Oh, all right, church. Hey, why don't you stand to your feet? Come on, we're going to have some fun this morning. Yay. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when, when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. I'll praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters. My enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I praise when I feel it, and I'll praise when I don't. I praise because I know. You're still in control. How praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, hey, come on, who's excited to be in the Lord's house this morning? Let's see those hands. Yeah. I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Hey, come on. I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, give Jesus some praise. I said give Jesus some praise. Hallelujah. You guys can take a seat. 
Hey, good morning, church. We are so glad you decided to worship with us today. My name is Pastor Michael. I have the honor and the privilege of pastoring this house, and I want you to hear from me. You are loved, and your life has value. If it's your first time here, I want to ask you to do one thing. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you would take a minute, fill that out, jot down some information, and then drop it in our giving box or hand it to a member of our serve team. We would love to connect with you. We're so glad you decided to worship with us today. I have a few quick announcements as we continue on in a spirit of worship. The first is this. We have seven youth for 6th through 12th grade students that gathers every Wednesday night. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Service starts at 7 o'clock. It's an amazing time for our now gen, our students who are making an eternal impact for the kingdom right here in southwest Kansas to gather together, to play games, to worship, and to be encouraged by the word of God. So I want to invite you, if you're a 6th through 12th grader, to join us, or maybe you've got one at home. We want to invite you to bring them on Wednesday night. We've got 7 a.m. kids happening downstairs right now. Now we love the now generation, and so I want to encourage you, if you've got a, a child that's in kindergarten through fifth grade, or maybe you want to use our nursery and drop them off in there so you can pay attention and receive all God has for you during service today, please use that. We love you. We are here to serve you. Next Sunday, Sunday, April 14th, I want to encourage you to join us for a very special Sunday. One of my pastors, an incredible mentor in my life, and an overseer of our church, Pastor Jason Swan, lead pastor of Cornerstone Church in Garden City, is going to be in the house bringing the message. We're also going to be sharing a lot of vision regarding the Dodge City Church plant and a lot of other exciting things for the Church of Jesus Christ in our region. And so I want to encourage you, next Sunday is a Sunday you you do not want to miss. So make sure you get there for one of our two services. It's going to be an awesome time of fellowship together. Mark on your calendars now. Sunday, April 28th is our next baptism Sunday. Last Sunday, Easter weekend, we saw over 50 people make a decision for Jesus. Come on, can we just give Jesus some praise for that? Yeah, that's right. Over 50 people making a decision for Jesus. And we trust God at his word when Jesus invites his followers to repent and then be baptized. And so on Sunday, April 28th, we're going to gather around the baptism pool together. We're going to celebrate transformation. We're going to rejoice because lives are being changed. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe you were one last week and maybe today's the day where you're going to call on to Jesus for the very first time. I want to encourage you if you would say you're a follower of Jesus and you've not yet been water baptized to sign up to get baptized on Sunday, April 28th. Let myself know. You can email us at 7imchurch at gmail.com. Send us a message on Facebook or Instagram. But I also want you to know, even if you don't sign up, we're going to be ready and expectant for you to go all in for Jesus. I want to thank you guys for being such a generous church. It's because of your generosity that we truly do get to see the vision become a reality, to make heaven more crowded and see all people experience the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you today to sow a seed into what God's doing here. If it's your first time here, please feel no obligation to give. There's a giving envelope in the seat back in front of you if you'd like to give by cash or check today. Or the easiest way to give, the way I give, is head over to 7imchurch.com slash giving. You can make a one-time gift or set up a recurring tithe on there as well. I want you to know that God's going to bless you as you continue to bless his house and bless his church. I'm so excited about today's message, but first I want to get back into a time of worship. Why don't you guys stand to your feet? Let's hug your neighbor if you love him. High five him if you don't. Let's continue to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus. Welcome all.
All right, church, we're going to continue to worship together this morning. One thing I know that is true is we can have church, we can have lights, we can have sound, but until the Holy Spirit is present here, nothing changes. And so in this time of worship, we just want to come back and invite him to do what only he can do in this house. So come on, just join me in worship this morning. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here come flood the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence
Come on, church, lift your voice this morning. Don't just invite him into this place. Invite him into your heart. Invite him into your situation. Invite him into your marriage. Invite him into the life of your children. Father, you're welcome in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Church, Jesus rose from the dead not to just give you victory over death, hell, and the grave, but also to break the chains that were once holding you. Chains of depression, broken. Chains of anxiety, broken. Come on, sing this out this morning. this morning come on the remnant is rising with the bride of jesus come alive in this house this morning come on in jesus name. 
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Sing it out. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every Come on, remind your situation this morning. Come on, remind that diagnosis this morning. Yeah. Come on, tell the devil this morning. Yeah. To break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. declare it this morning there is power I said church declare it this morning there is power there is power in the name of Jesus you know I had this thought as we were singing I know some of you guys were like when is this song over like, it just keeps going but y'all sometimes we have to say it again and again and again and again and again until we believe that there truly is power in the name of Jesus. You know, we've got to look our situation in the eye and say, no, you don't have a hold on me. There's power in the name of Jesus. Some of us, we need to look depression in the face and say, no, you don't have a hold on me. There's power in the name of Jesus. Some of us need to believe with a little bit of faith that at all the doctor said was, no, there's nothing we can do. Oh, but you don't know my God. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
Some of y'all need to look at your spouse and say, I know it hasn't been easy. I know we've put divorce on the table, but I serve a God who is a God of restoration. There is power in the name of Jesus. Some of y'all need to call your children today and say, I know you're not going to believe any word I say, but son, I need you to know today there's power in the name of Jesus. God loves you. He's not forsaken you. He's not forgotten you. Come on, church, let's pray. Father God, we know that there's power in your name. And because you walked out of that grave, we have the ability to not just conquer death, hell, and the grave, but we have the freedom to walk in that today. That change that once held us back can fall today at the feet of Jesus. That depression can be broken in the name of Jesus. That addictions will be broken in the name of Jesus. That generational curses that have held our family back generation after generation will be broken today because of the power that is in the name above every other name. And so Jesus, as we gather in your house, as we seek your presence and as we open your word, would you transform us from the inside out? God, would you allow all of us to leave this place different? Then when we came in, because we had an encounter with the power that is in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, continue to have your way here in this house, just as in heaven. And together as a church, all of God's people said, amen. I said all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. You guys can be seated. What's up, boys? Man, I'm fired up. I'm excited. How many of y'all are excited to be in church today? Hey, just a, a random housekeeping thing. Um, I love you guys, but it's hard to see you when you're that far in the back. So just so you know, we put the ropes there so we fill up the front first. So I know some of y'all be back row Baptists. I get it. But I'd rather see your beautiful face. Ugly people, you can stay in the back, all right? So we just going to know next week how you feel about yourself. That's all I'm saying. If you think you're pretty, come up front. We're in, uh, we're in Luke 15 today. Uh, man, I, I, I'm fired up. I'm excited. Um, I've had a few energy drinks. Can you tell? <laughs> no, God's here. And uh, this message has been burning in my heart. And so I, I want to celebrate real quick while y'all are turning in your Bibles to Luke 15. Uh, Easter weekend was last weekend. Come on, how many of y'all missed it? Don't own up to it. Now put your hand down. Don't call yourself out like that. We had an awesome time. We had three services across the weekend. We had 380 people join us in person that weekend. Come on, can we give Jesus some praise? Can we give Jesus some praise? And here's what I know. Like, y'all, we still have in church today. So we got to go find those 180 that aren't here today and say, hey, just so you know, we have church every week. It's not just Christmas and Easter. Like, come on back. But uh, we, we love to, to just celebrate numbers because I love numbers because every number is a person and every person has a soul. And, and every soul has a story. And, and I believe that God's moving. We saw over 50 people give their life to Jesus last week. And come on, can we rejoice with heaven over that? And, and I truly believe we're just getting started. Like, I'll, I'll just be honest, and, and I know this is going to freak some of y'all out. If you think we've seen church, we ain't seen nothing yet. Like, if you think you've seen God move in your life, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're not interested in settling and getting comfortable and saying, woohoo, we made it. No, we're going to keep storming the gates of hell. We're going to keep pulling people out, and we're going to keep saving souls until Jesus returns. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but that might be tomorrow. Hey. Like, I mean, I, I'm just saying, some of y'all be sending me all these conspiracy videos. I'm going to just be honest. I ain't watched none of them because I don't care. Like, eclipse or not, I'm going to worship Jesus to the day he comes back. So I'm going to be ready. So whenever he comes back, I'm ready. That's what I believe. Like, we don't have to get ready if we stay ready. Like, let's just, let's just love Jesus. Let's just love people. Let's make heaven crowded. And uh, he's going to come back when he's coming back. We're in Luke 15 this morning. Some uh, context 
to the passage today is Jesus typically found two groups of people who would really kind of follow him and do life with him. One of those was a group called the sinners. And if you're one of those in the room, you said, amen. But uh, this was the people that they'd be prostitutes. They'd be the drunks. They'd be the tax collectors. These are the people that did not have it all together. And so Jesus would typically seek out these type of people, spend time with them, eat with them. And so that group was kind of around him. But there was another group that liked to follow Jesus. This is the group that I would call the elitists. These were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Like these were the homies that been doing sword drills since the time they came out of the womb. Like they knew the Torah inside and out. They knew the Old Testament. They knew all of God's commandments. They were ready to follow Jesus. And one of their greatest joys came when they found Jesus messing up. Or they thought they had found Jesus messing up. And so they like to question him and analyze everything he was doing. And in Luke 15, I'm just setting the stage here. Jesus is having a conversation with some people. And behind his back, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees start interrogating Jesus' disciples. And, and they pull up on the boys and they're like, Yo, tell us why your leader is hanging out with them. Who's them? The sinners. Because the Sadducees and Pharisees didn't like to hang around the sinners. And so they were asking the disciples, hey, tell me why Jesus keeps hanging out with them. And Jesus, you know, the all-knowing God of the universe that he is, he heard them talking about him behind his back, and he just called them out on it. He's like, hey, boys, y'all talking about me? Let's bring me into the picture. And so Jesus wants to try and captivate their hearts with his why of hanging around sinners. And so he begins storytelling. Jesus loved to teach in parables. He loved to break down his principles in these stories to try and make people understand and comprehend the point that he was trying to make. And so he starts with one story. And he tells a story of a farmer who had a hundred sheep. And he talks about one sheep running away and he stresses the emphasis, would that farmer not leave the 99 to go seek the one? Why? Because the one was important. And then he would go on to say that all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents more than the 99 who are already righteous. And he tells this story and it's almost as if the Pharisees were human because they were too dumb to totally get it. So Jesus goes to another story. And he says, let me tell you about a woman who had 10 coins and she lost one of them. Let me tell you something about the doctrine of Jesus. It's never wrong. Women lose everything. Just, I just feel in the room, y'all. I try to wake you up. I, I'm, the, I, I'm the one that loses stuff in my house. I set it down. I do 100 tasks. I forget where I put it. And then my wife is like, do you need my eyes on this? It's right there. She's like... I got the Wi-Fi. I know where your stuff is. I'm like, all right, well, glad I have someone to take care of me. But this woman loses a coin, and it says she invites her friends over to tear the house apart. Why? To try and find this one lost coin, because all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents more than the nine righteous. And it's almost as if the Sadducees and Pharisees were human, because it took Jesus a third story. And so we pick up in Luke 15, verse 11, Jesus continues speaking. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of your inheritance. So he divided the inheritance between them. I'm going to stop right there. I, I want us to really understand what's happening here because Culturally, let's be honest, some of us might not completely understand what this son is saying to his father. The son has come to his father and he has essentially declared this. Dad, I don't just want your money. I don't just want your stuff. I actually wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. An inheritance was only given when a father would die. 
And so the son was coming to the father saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Here's what I believe. The son wasn't just concerned about the belongings. He was more interested in removing the father's voice from his life. Almost as if some of us, if we're not careful, we can go to God and say the same thing. God, I don't want your voice in my life. I want to live my life my way. It's not just about the money, but I believe the son wanted to remove the father's authority, wanted to remove the father's stance in his life. And we see that because the younger son chooses to leave home after he receives the belongings. But I want you to see something I've never seen before in this passage, and I've probably preached it a hundred times. That's why I love the word of God. It's the only book that reads you as you read it. The younger son comes to the father. Father, give me my share of your inheritance. And then it goes on to say, so the father divided the inheritance between them. I'll be honest. I always thought the father just gave the younger son his portion. But did you catch that? It says the father gave his inheritance and divided it between them. So both the younger son and the older son both receive their inheritance. Guess what, church? The dad's not dead. What am I trying to say? This is what I felt Holy Spirit say to me when I caught that this week. The father had enough to give everything away, and he still had enough to provide for his house. Because guess what? After the father split the inheritance, what did he have to do? He had to put food on the table. He had to pay his workers. He had to take care of the cattle. He had to fix the roof when the shingles blew off. There was still a house to take care of. And yet the father had enough to give his entire inheritance away. And yet he still had enough to take care of the house. We'll begin to see as we unpack the rest of this story that this father is a picture of the God we serve. And I'm here to tell you this morning, church, that God has enough to give everything away and still take care of you. He has enough to solve all of the world's problems and still be concerned about your issue. Still be concerned about your marriage. Still be concerned about the salvation of your children. Still be concerned about your body that is decaying that needs his healing touch. Your father has enough to love the people that we don't think can be loved, but he still has enough to provide for you. He has enough. The father divides his inheritance, and we continue in verse 13. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had had. He set off for Fort Hayes. He got drunk every weekend and squandered his wealth at college parties, living and wild living. And after he had spent all of daddy's money, the government took all the cattle away and a famine happened and he realized he was in need. I'm paraphrasing, all right? So what did he do? He went out and hired himself as a slave to the country. Can I tell you something? He never had to work a day in his life in his father's house, but the minute he ignored the father's voice, he became a slave. And he realized, I'm in need, I need a job. And so he made himself to become a slave to the country. They sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. Verse 16, he longed to see his stomach filled with the pods that the pigs were eating, yet no one gave him anything. And then when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's servants are well fed and here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but take me on as one of your slaves. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. 
The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! I, I, I love that because the son had rehearsed what he was going to say. He, you know, he was going to tell his father, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And, and let me be a slave. But it's almost as if when the son gets to the father and the son starts apologizing, the father interrupts him. And he's like, no, quick, go get the rope. Get the best rope. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive, was lost and now is found. So they began to play that funky music, white boy, and celebrate. Come on, somebody. This dad was ecstatic that his son had returned home. I, I want you to see here. Jesus is in a room where there's sinner and Pharisee, and yet he wanted everyone to know in this moment that God has enough. If we wanted to look at it even deeper, we could almost paint this picture as if the older son probably would have found himself in the Pharisee crowd. The younger son would have identified more with the sinners, and yet even in both of these moments... Jesus is looking at the sinner and the Pharisee alike saying, I love you because God has enough. And I don't know who needs to be reminded of that truth this morning. Maybe you need to relearn your heavenly father's will for you just a little bit today. But I want to remind you that he has enough. Because if we're not careful, church, here's what we'll do. We'll believe that God has enough for them. But we don't believe he has enough for me. We'll believe that God has enough to fix their marriage, but oh, our marriage is too far gone. We don't have the belief that he has enough for us. We'll believe that God has enough to heal them of their cancer, but he doesn't have enough to heal my dad. I, oh, I don't know if God has enough. Oh, he has enough. We'll believe God has enough to bless them, but oh, does he have enough to bless me? He has enough. We'll sit and listen to testimonies of restoration of people who have overcome addictions. And we'll believe in that moment. Oh, God had enough to help them overcome their addiction. But oh, does he have enough to help me? Your God has enough. I don't know who came to church today believing that their God was limited, but let Ephesians 3.16 speak to your heart this morning. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength that can only come through his spirit. Let me tell you something, church. We serve a God who has unlimited resources. And if you believe it this morning, say amen. amen. Come on. God has enough. A few things I want us to see from the text this morning. The first is this. God has enough to feed you. And some of y'all already getting them pre-lunch gurgles and you're like, amen, he's got enough to feed me. Sounds simple, right? But it's true. The sun returns. What caused the sun to wake up to the reality of his need for his father. A hungry appetite. It was in the pig's pen when he realized that that food that they're feeding the pigs looks inviting to me. And he had his light bulb wake up moment when he goes, wait, I'm hungry. And not even the slaves in my father's house went without food. I must return to my father. And can I tell you something? That's why it was so important when the son returned that the father called for the fattened calf to be slaughtered. Because he had enough for his hungry son. I, I don't know a lot about pigs. Do I got any pig farmers in here? Praise the Lord. We're good, clean, living folk. All right. Because pigs are nasty. I, let's just be honest. You don't give the pigs the good food. Like you, you give the pigs the food that's too nasty to even give your dog and your dog eats its own poop. So like the pigs get the worst of the worst of the worst. They get the nasty of the nasty of the nasty. And let me tell you something. This son found himself in a place where that nasty food for the pigs looked appetizing to him. 
Here's one thing I know about this son, that he came from a wealthy family. How do I know that? Because it says his father had slaves. You didn't have slaves if you didn't have money. And so I can tell you, I guarantee that son, he'd never worried about food a day in his life. He was eating filet mignon and tiramisu every single night on a golden plate. Like he didn't have to worry about nothing. And yet in this moment, because he's now been separated from his father's voice, his father's covering, his father's house, he's now finding the food that the pigs are eating inviting. But oh, this isn't about food. Because here's one thing I know. The further you get from the father's house, the more appetizing sin will look. The further you get from your heavenly father's presence, the more appetizing what you thought was nasty and gross will become. Here's one thing I know about appetite. If we're not careful, we'll begin to get hungry for things that will cause us to do things we never would have dreamed of doing. When we lose sight that God says that we are a masterpiece and we think that our affirmation and validation only comes from the people around us, we will find ourselves doing things out of an appetite that we never would have done before. When we lose sight of the forgiveness and the grace that has been so freely given to us, we will find ourselves justifying the things that we're doing that we never would have done before to find affirmation, to find acceptance, and to find pleasure. Church, if we're not careful, our appetite will cause us to crave things that we never would have done in the presence of our Father. And that's where the Son has found himself. But may I remind you, church, that appetite has always been the enemy's plan of deception and distraction from day one. Like, do you know the story? Genesis 3. If you don't know it, I'll tell it to you. The serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The snake is pulling the woman away from the presence of God, enticing her in regards to appetite. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And to the snake, the woman responded, we may eat fruit from any tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And lest you touch it, you will die. And oh, in a moment where Eve could have ran back to hear her father's voice to receive the affirmation that she needed. She chose to fall into the deception of the enemy when he said, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The very first sin of humanity was centered around appetite. Adam and Eve were given every fruit every tree, every blessing in the garden. And yet in a moment where Eve was entertained by the enemy's thoughts, rather than sitting with the voice of her father, she made a mistake. And sin entered the world. I I found it so interesting in my time this week when I was studying. You know, I love how Eve quotes God. Like, she, she literally quotes God. She's like, but God said, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And so, like, one thing I know when I, when I see those quotes, I like to go find the original text that's being quoted. And so, if we look back at Genesis 2, 16 and 17, I'm giving you reference so you can study it more on your own this week. This is when God tells Adam and Eve the command regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And all God says to them is you must not eat from the tree. And yet in Genesis 3, what does Eve say? Well, God said we can't eat from it or touch it or we will die. (laughs) God never said they couldn't touch it. God just said they couldn't look at it. 
Here's what I know. You'll make God say things he never said when you distance yourself from him. You spend enough time talking with the enemy, whoo, you'll begin to think God said things he never said. You'll begin to affirm sin that God died to set you free from. Eve wasn't even hungry, but because she entertained the thought from the devil in regards to her appetite, she made a desperate decision that separated her from the presence of God. Just like this son finding himself in the pig pen. You know, the Bible says that when he got there, he was so hungry that the pods that the pigs were eating began to look appetizing to him. Can I tell you something, church? The son wasn't hungry when he got to the pig pen. He was hungry long before he left his father's house. That's why he went to his dad and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. He was hungry for power. He was hungry for authority. He was hungry for money. He was hungry for wealth. He was hungry for his freedom. And yet it was in a moment where his flesh caught up with his soul that he realized it's not about the food and the pen. But there's a hunger inside of me that can't be distinguished or separated apart from my father. The devil always uses appetite. Let me tell you about a man named Jesus, the son of God. He gets baptized. He comes out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And there's this beautiful, glorious picture of God the Father in heaven affirming his son. And then the Bible says through the Holy Spirit, he's led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And who shows up? The devil. What is the first thing the devil tries to steal from Jesus? His appetite. Oh, aren't you the son of God? Can't you look at the rocks and turn them into King's Hawaiian rolls? Aren't you hungry, Jesus? Doesn't your flesh have an appetite? Don't you desire some food? And oh, but in that moment, Jesus silences the enemy with what? The word of God. When he declares in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Our appetite. It is a battle of flesh and soul. Are there things that we crave? Absolutely. But let me encourage you as well. Having an appetite for things of this world by themselves is not a sin. It's when your appetite for the things of this world overpower your appetite for the presence of God. Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone. He does not say, man can't eat bread. What am I trying to say? It's okay to have an appetite for success and still be a follower of Jesus. It's okay to have an appetite to make a difference in people's lives and still be a follower of Jesus. It's okay to have an appetite for worldly things and still be a, a follower of Jesus. The problem is when your appetite for those things becomes greater than your appetite for Jesus. Like, I, I just going to be honest, it breaks my heart when people knock on preachers and pastors who have all these nice things, who care about their house, and, and they have all these beautiful, you know, things. God didn't say those things are bad. He said when your desire for those things becomes greater than your desire for me, there's a problem. Why? Because there is something found in the man named Jesus that nothing in this world can actually replace. And there is a part of every single soul because you were made in the image of God that is going to crave something in its deepest form that can only be found in Jesus. And we can make a substitute for everything else on this earth, but you cannot make a substitute for the presence and the blood of Jesus Christ. When your appetite for the world grows stronger than your appetite for the presence of God, we've got a problem. We've got to have a wake-up moment 
We're just like the prodigal son. We realize we need to get back to our father. God has enough to feed you, church. But he also has enough to clothe you. Did you catch that? The son returns home. And one of the first things the father says is this. Quick, get my finest robe. Why is this important? I believe the first thing the father wanted to do was clothe his son. And I believe something God wants to do for you in your life is to clothe you. Why is clothing important? Well, it's important because it does two things. It covers and it identifies. Clothing covers and identifies. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve. They, they, because of a lack of appetite for God, they fall into this trap called sin. What does it say they do after they sin? They recognize their nakedness and they begin to make clothing out of fig leaves. And from that moment on, we all know the importance of clothes. Can I get an amen? Anyone show up to church naked today? All right. Those that are naked, they stayed at home and watched online. That's why they're not here. <laughs> oh, that's an image I do not want in my head. <laughs> Woo! We know how important clothing is, but here's one thing I know about clothing. We all do it a little bit different. I, I, no joke, I've literally had people come up to me, and just because of the clothes I wear, they look me up and down, and they go, you ain't from here. <laughs> no, I'm not. Clothing is interesting. Some of us, we actually showed up to church in the clothes we slept in last night. Others of us, that's the 10th outfit you put on this morning before you walked out the door. Others of you, you tried on one shirt and you were like, oh, I've gained a little weight. Got to put on a bigger shirt to cover that. Some of y'all, you woke up, you looked in the mirror and said, "Woo, I need to clothe myself with some makeup so they don't see the real me. Or this, you looked in the mirror and you go, ah, I don't have any eyebrows. I better clothe myself with some eyebrows. And that's why you haven't been baptized yet. Because you'd go in that water and you'd come out a new creation. We'd be like, ah, I just say it. We all clothe ourselves a little bit different, but here's one thing I know about clothing. No matter how hard you try to clothe yourself, it will never be enough to cover your sin. It will never be enough. Just like the fig leaves in Genesis 3. I, I bet Adam and Eve thought they were like the Louis Vuitton of their day. They're like, oh, we'll get these bougie fig leaves and make some clothes. And then guess what happens when you remove a leaf from a tree? It dries out and cracks. And so like day one, they'd be looking bougie. Day three, they're taping duct tape on these fig leaves trying to hold them together. Like you can't clothe yourself. And that's why. In Genesis 3, the word says this. The Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Almost if God knew every attempt they were going to make to cover their nakedness would never be enough. So I've made them a new cloth. I've made them clothing that won't decay. I've made them clothing that won't rot. I've made them clothing that won't crack and break and will continue to cover them. And I'm here to tell the church that that moment was not just for the sin in the garden. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. That on that cross, the Lamb of God, an animal was slain and his skin and that blood and those bloodstains garments today can cover you and all of your shortcomings, all of your failures. And so stop trying to clothe yourself and come to the father and let him clothe you with his robe clothing covers and if we're not careful what will happen when we become followers of jesus is we'll fall back into some things of our old life and we'll begin to try to clothe ourselves again and clothing starts to look like this we sing really loud in church. We wear a smile to church. We say we're blessed and highly favored, but inside we're rotting and decaying because we have a secret addiction that we're not letting anybody know about. 
We make our Facebook page look like we got the best marriage. We love each other so much. We got kids that smile for family pictures. Like, y'all, if you have a family picture posted on social media of all your children smiling, it's fake. I gotta, there's got to be some Jim Bob that's pissed off during family pictures that's just like, I understand. And when we make Facebook, we make these clothing, we make it look like everything is fine. But at home, we're cussing out our kids. We haven't been intimate with our spouse in a few years, but we make it look like everything is okay. Or maybe if we're parents, we clothe ourselves by buying our kids all the great things, giving them everything they ask for because we're clothing the reality that we really don't know how to be mom or dad. And we don't spend enough time with them being mom or dad, so we just buy them what they need and we clothe them with kindness. Church, we've got to realize that when we try to clothe ourselves, it will never be enough. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there is a garment that has been stained by the blood of the lamb, that when it's placed upon your life and when you come to him with the humility and allow him to clothe you, it will cover every area of your life. But oh, praise God, clothing doesn't just cover, it also gives identity. Clothing identifies, do y'all know that? That's why I can go up to Dodge City this afternoon and I can walk into Walmart and I can pray before I go in because y'all Walmart, like it just gets my blood boiling. I'm just saying, can't stand Walmart. But I can go in there and I can buy a black t-shirt for $4.99. Then I can get in my car and I can drive across to another parking lot and I can walk into this bougie store for cowboys they call Big R and I can buy a black t-shirt for $74.99. Why? Because my Walmart t-shirt has Hanes right here and the big R t-shirt has Carhartt right here. Clothing identifies. Like you guys do realize that we don't have that many car manufacturers in the world, yet there's a hundred different emblems put on a vehicle. Like Chevy and Cadillac come from the same place. And yet we see somebody driving a beat up Chevy and we're like, oh, they a broke farmer. We see somebody rolling in a Cadillac and we're like, ooh, they got money. Just because of the emblem, just because the covering identifies. But can I tell you something? We can try with all of our might to cover ourselves with other things, to try and give ourselves an identity with all these emblems, logos, and images. But the only covering that you need in your life that will change your identity is the covering that is found through the blood of Jesus Christ. His covering will clothe you, will cover you, and will identify you. Isaiah 61.10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. You know, in the presence of God, <laughs> your identity changes. In Luke 15, the son returns home and the father interrupts him as the son's apologizing, talking about all of his mess-ups. All of his scrubs. And the dad says, quick, get the finest robe. Like they're not even at the house. The Bible says the father ran out to meet the son. And yet one of the first things the father wants to do is clothe him with his robe. Why? I can tell you one thing. The son, when he returned home, did not look like the son that left the house the first time. And so although the Bible says the father recognized the son from a long way off, can I tell you something? I bet some of the servants in the house wouldn't have recognized him. I bet some of the cousins and memaws and papas that were there probably wouldn't have even recognized him. Yet the father wanted to restore the son's identity as soon as he returned. And so he called for the best robe. Why? Because he did not want anybody to look at his son for his past. He wanted to see the son for who he is. The father wanted everyone to know in that moment and wanted the son to be reminded in that moment 
you are still my child. Get the best robe. Can I tell you what the best robe in the house would have been? It would have been the father's robe. And so dad looked at the people and said, hey, go fetch my robe. Put it on my son. Y'all, I'm telling you, that's the response of our heavenly father. No matter how far we go, no matter how much we mess up, God is looking at us saying, fetch my robe and put it on you. Why? Because clothing identifies. Here's what I know to be true, church. In Jesus, your identity is not found in what you did or where you've been, but in who you are because of whose you are. Come on. And when you come to Jesus... And y'all, this is why it takes some humility to recognize this. But when you come to Jesus and say, Father, I need you to clothe me. When you remind yourself of whose you are, I'm telling you, it changes everything. Because what the world sees as a sinner and as a drunk, God sees as free and a son. What the world sees as broken and addicted, God sees as set apart and overcomer. What the world sees as a screw-up and as a mess-up, God sees as redeemed and sanctified. What the world sees as chains and a screw-up, God sees as transformed and set free. Because whom the Son sets free, church, oh, he is free indeed. God has enough. He has enough. He has enough to feed you. He has enough to clothe you. And as we close this morning, I want you to also understand this. He has enough to believe in you. God has enough to believe in you. Now, I know there's probably some that are thinking, I don't even believe in me. Hmm. That's okay. God does. Or there's others thinking, I know God believed in me enough once. He saved me when I was a young kid, but my life has looked drastically different from that moment. I've fallen off time and time again. I've said yes to Jesus, and then I've slipped back into addiction. I've said yes to Jesus, and then I've abused again. I've said yes to Jesus, and then I've drank again. I've said yes to Jesus, and I've smoked pot again. I've said yes to Jesus, and I've slept around again. I've said yes to Jesus, and I've fallen short again. Are you sure he still believes in me? Yes, he has enough. Not to just believe in you once, but to believe in you again and again and again and again. The father, when the son came to him, Father, give me my share of your inheritance. The father splits the inheritance between both sons. Can I tell you something? One son left the house, the other remained faithful. And yet even when the son ran away and was not faithful to the father's voice, he still loved him enough to believe in him again when he returned. The son comes home. The father says, quick, get the best robe. It says that he called for the fattened calf to be slaughtered. Can I tell you something? This is so crazy. They were fattening a calf for this day because the father believed in the son enough that he knew he would return. Like, just just think about that. The father didn't say, hey, we got to go to Jim Bob's down the road and buy one of their fattened calves because we didn't expect our son to be back, but now he's back. No, the father was preparing a calf to be fattened for this moment. Why? Because he believed in him. He knew he was going to return. He knew at some point he would wake up to the reality that he needed his father's voice, that he needed his father's covering, that he needed his father's robe. And so when the son returned, the father was ready because he believed in him. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what's been done to you. I don't care what's been said about you. Your heavenly father is waiting for you to come home. He's fattening the calf because he knows you're hungry. 
He's storing up treasure because he's waiting to bless you. He's got his power in the reserve because he knows that you need a miracle touch from heaven in your life. He's not going to be surprised when you come home. I love that the father, oh, Daniel, whoo. Not once. Not once does dad look at his son and say, dang, man, you let me down. Not once did he look at his son and go, oh, you've been sinning, haven't you? Not once did he look at his son and say, where all the money go I gave you? He wasn't even interested in the shortcomings of his son. He was rejoicing because he was home. And I'm telling you, I know it to be true because I've been there. There are times that we don't feel worthy to come into the presence of God because we think he's going to be mad at us. We think he's going to question us. We think he's going to call us out. But I'm here to tell you right now, your God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And he's sitting on the porch just like this father. So when you start to come back, he's going to run to you and he's going to meet you where you are. Because he loves you. He believes in you, and he's got a plan for you, and it's a good plan to prosper you, to give you new life, to set you free. The father calls for the calf to be slaughtered. He calls for the robe, and it also says he, he calls for a ring to be placed on his finger and sandals on his feet. Why is this important? The ring would have been a, a family signet ring that would have established his role and identity in the family. The sandals would have been placed on his feet because the slaves did not wear sandals, but sons wore sandals. Can I tell you what the father was doing? He was looking at his son and he was telling him, even though you failed me, I'm going to restore you. Even though you don't believe in you, I believe in you. Even though you've messed up, I'm calling you mine. Even though you think you're too messed up, I'm setting you free. I'm giving you a place in the family. And can I tell you what he's going to do? Because the son's role in the family has been reestablished in this moment. When the father does die, guess what the son is going to receive again? The inheritance. And I don't know about you, but my Bible says there's an inheritance for every believer in heaven. And no matter how many times you've ran away, no matter how many times you've fallen short, when you come back to the presence of God and you run to your father in repentance and you receive his covering and forgiveness, he is going to reestablish not just a relationship with you now, but he's going to reestablish your inheritance for eternity. God believes in you enough. Why? Because Jesus has the capacity to look past your past and see your potential. Let me tell you something, church. Your past does not matter in the presence of Jesus. Your past doesn't matter. That's why the Bible says it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because in Christ, the old is gone. The new has come. You see, I've read this story probably a thousand times. And almost every time I try to figure out and ask myself, because the story goes on, after the son returns, we see the older brother get a little upset about the way that his younger brother is treated, and there's a whole other lesson in that. But I've kind of pondered, I'm like, what's the, who's the main person in this story? Who is Jesus trying to get us to focus on in this story? Because he tells the story of a farmer with sheep, and it's almost as if the priority of that story is the one lost sheep. And then he goes on to tell the story of the woman with the ten coins. And it's almost as if the priority of that story is the one coin. But then he tells this story. And I'm like, who's the priority? Is it the son? Is it the brother? Can I tell you who I believe the priority of the story is? It's the father. Because after Jesus taught these stories of a lost sheep and a lost coin, he realized they weren't getting the point. And the greatest point that he wanted everybody in that room to remember that day 
was there's a father in heaven who loves them so much that he gave his one and only son to die for them. And that in the presence of Jesus, anything can change for anyone. Freedom is made possible. Acceptance takes place. Forgiveness happens and transformation occurs. It's less about the sinner and more about the dad. Why? Because that is the same God that we serve today, church. And I want you to know this morning that he has enough. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Your word that is alive and transforming. Your word that reads us as we read it. Your word that is the truth and the foundation for everything that we believe. We thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit, as you fellowship with us and minister to hearts in this room and those online today. Jesus, we thank you for the blood, for your sacrifice, that while you were on that cross at your lowest point, we were still your greatest priority. And you saw it fit to go to death on a cross so you could have a relationship with us. Because we all owed a debt we couldn't pay, but you paid a debt you didn't know. And you took it upon yourself. And so this morning, Father, I want to pray for the prodigal in the room or online today. For the one who's maybe said yes to Jesus in their past, or maybe they've never come to the realization that they don't just need the Father's forgiveness in their life, but they need his voice. They need the food that only he can provide. They need the covering and the blessing on their life. And so this morning, if that's you, I've got great news. Your father is waiting and he has enough. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and was raised on the third day, you shall be saved. And so here's what I know to be true. You don't have to go through a six-step class to experience all that God has for you. You don't have to look some, some bishop or pope in the eye and confess to them in order to see God forgive you. You just have to go to your heavenly Father with a repentant heart to repent of your sin, to declare that he is who he says he is, to receive your forgiveness that he is waiting for you because while you were a sinner, Christ died to forgive you. And to declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord of your life. So this morning, if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity right now to have that conversation with your heavenly father. It's not a fancy set of words. Let it come from your heart to say, dad, I need you. I repent of my sin. I submit my life to you. I surrender my will to you. You are Lord of my life. I believe that you died and rose on the third day. However it is that you talk to your Father in heaven, tell him right now. And for the rest of this house and those who are followers of Jesus today, Lord, I pray you would continue to give us a posture of humility. That you would allow the appetite of our soul that can only be found in you to grow stronger and stronger. That as this world fights for our attention and fights for everything else, that we would come back to our source of truth and the source of life that is only found in you. That you would break chains of addiction that were once a lifeline for some in this room, that they would now find the same joy that they once found in those things in your presence because your presence never runs empty. And they don't need another hit or another drink to get to that place. But, oh, Jesus, you give us everything when we need it. Lord, I pray that we would have the humility to allow you to clothe us this morning. So, Lord, we come to you and we ask that you would put your garments around us. That you would clothe us with your robe of righteousness because we are not righteous on our own. We are not even worthy to be wearing a title, son or daughter of the king. But when you clothe us, it doesn't just cover us. It identifies us as who you created us to be. And Lord, give us the faith to believe that even in the moments where we've given up on believing in ourselves, you still believe in us. And that no matter how many times we fail, how many times we mess up, you are still waiting on the porch like the father waiting for the return of his son, waiting for us to come home. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for having enough. We pray this all in your holy and precious name and all of God's people said. Amen. Come on, church, all of God's people said. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? Let's close with our declaration this morning. All right, let's end it right, church. God, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Holy, Spirit, we Holy Spirit, we invite you to help us go be the church. Service is over. Church is not. We'll see y'all next week.